But I've been focusing on, on the experience a little bit for the child, for the parent. What's important is that uh, underneath there's a lot more going on. I, I'm going to touch on this more later. First, we talked about the face-directed gaze. And so now the next unit is the emotion recognition. And you saw that uh, in play there in that video. But again, getting points for choosing what's correct. Now, by the way, how is he choosing? So he's seeing these different emoticons and tilting the head. We've got an accelerometer in there. It's measuring your head motions 100 times a second. That's all you need to do. And we can also pick up blinks. There's a little camera on the inside that monitors your blinks. So he can just, uh, you know, do a little thing like that. And now we have a form of interaction. So again, you know, see a scene, choose which emoticon is correct, and get the point where the emoticon is a much more reduced and simplified version of the fairly complex display. On top of that, he can go back and review later and see how he did, do it again, and try to improve. And so right there are a few of the things, and I think I wanted to um, explain this a little bit more. So one of the things we're doing is creating videos for the parents so they can see it ahead of time and learn. And so here's one of the videos you'll recognize the person giving the voice over. Sean and his mother are in the BrainPower Boston office, beta testing the emotion apps on the BrainPower system. Okay, glass. First up, it's the emotion game. Will Sean be able to guess his mother's emotions? She smiles. He chooses happy with a head movement. Correct, you get a point, Sean. Now it's time for the second emotion. His mother is looking pretty neutral. Sean picks that option with a head movement. Nice job, Sean. On to the next app, Emotion Decode. The brain power system detects his mother's emotions and gives both audio and video feedback to Sean. Happy, sad, then back to happy. So he loves it. And uh, of course, that was Arsha's voice. So those are just two of the modules. And I can't go into them all, but we have a bunch. And this came from asking parents what was important and making software to address, for instance, language, basic learning, and then speech and complex interactions, how close to stand, how loudly to speak, what tones of voice to use, and so forth that one that picks up the head rocking and gives a relaxing experience to get the person out of that stressful moment at that time, and so forth. But what matters now, I think, even more in light of what Arsha was talking about, in light of where we're going, is what's happening underneath. This is the data, the big data. Autism is studied in groups of 10 or 20 at the universities. We could potentially have 10 or 20,000 or more and if you have a very skilled BCBA working with that child, she or he can notice he's making better eye contact right now, but probably not 629 times a face was within a foveal view and he or she made eye contact 127 of those times in the day, while also measuring how many seconds of rocking behavior there were, while also measuring HPA axis stuff like heart rate variability and breathing dynamics and blinking dynamics. No way, right? No human being is going to be writing that down. Human beings should do what human beings are good at, deep clinical insight, profound and important decisions, not paperwork and busy work and bean counting. Computers are very good at bean counting. Very good. So let's use them for that. And so underneath while all these fun experiences are going on, while the child feels like he's playing the coolest video game and mom's playing along and everything's cool, we're finding out things that have never been able to be found out. Uh, or we're recording data that 
we could never have recorded before, so that we can find out what are those subtypes of autism. Why does one symptom cluster correlate, or does it correlate with another? Which subset of people with light or sound sensory sensitivity is going to be crossover with those with gastrointestinal complications with autism? We don't know yet. And we certainly don't know the performance data. So the point here is to measure performance data, where the performance on the game is the assessment of that particular skill and is the progression in that. How is my child doing today, being the question. So we've been fortunate enough to test already with 200 adults and children with autism, and that's before the clinical trial, as we iterated the software. And now the clinical trial, as I mentioned, is um, uh, 700 people. And even prior to that, we've had about 2,000 signups on the website, people very interested. These are big numbers, these are small numbers, depends on how you look at it. But these are real families with individual and unique children who are curious and who found us organically because we're not selling yet and we're not advertising. Um, but they've found our website and seen the news. So it's very exciting, but we have a huge obligation to them to bring the distillate of clinical knowledge, very rigorous techniques with the data, and the idea that we're answering to those deep-seated existential needs of the families. One thing you could do to help is, if you know families, just kind of direct them along to this link, which will be on there on the slides. It's that simple because people can take it from there, we can take it from there. Now it's starting in the US, but we're working with various partners already to extend out the study and or testing broadly. And hopefully I'll have such a good experience today. You guys never told me what I'm supposed to do later today. I'll quiz you later. Um, I'll have such a good experience that I'll have to come back here and make this one of the, the first test sites internationally.